Okay, good morning, everyone. And uh, good morning to our students online as well. All right, so let's just pick up from where we stopped last week. Uh, somebody's, uh, can you please mute whoever's logged in here? Just mute your, okay. Okay, so before we go ahead, uh, let's just look at a quick review of what we did uh, in our first class. So we looked at the introduction to who we are in Christ. We remember we looked at that example where an orphan who who comes a, a, a rich man comes takes him and now his identity is changed. Right? He's no more an orphan. He's now a rich man's son. So you and I as believers, the Lord Jesus bought us with a price, and we are God's children. So we must behave like God's children. Amen? Right? We must behave like that. Right? And then we looked at how, as God's children, it'll change the way we relate to God. You don't have to be scared. Oh, what if God punishes me? No, it changes the way we relate to God. It changes the way we look at difficulties and challenges. All of us will face difficulties. All of us will face challenges. But how do we look at it? What, 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 when we look at those challenges, what is our response, right? And it'll change our lifestyle. It'll change the way we uh, look at demonic work and how the devil is working. It'll change the way we, you know, we look at all of that. And then it'll change the way we relate to people. How, how, how do we relate to people? Not just believers, but to unbelievers also. Then we looked at... Um, Section one, we looked at you in me and I in him. We looked at the book of John, the vine and the branches. We also saw some examples, right? Remember that? What did we do? We, took, we remember the example of the seed. You put a seed, you put an apple seed. What happens? Mango comes out. Apple comes out, right? So this, if we are connected to the vine, we are the branches. If we are connected to the vine, we will their fruit. It's automatic. You don't have to do anything, right? Now, we also looked at chapter 3, that the Lord Jesus, he called us before the foundation of the world. So we saw that, you know, Jesus didn't say, uh, God the Father didn't say, oh, Adam, you ate the fruit, now what do I do? No. Before the foundation of the world, he has called you and me. He has chosen us as his children. And he's given a whole list of things that we are. Can you give me some, some of our, what, what we can call ourselves? What are some of the names that we can call ourselves? Come on, we are chosen, blessed, covered, okay, sealed with the Holy Spirit. So many things are there, no? Sanctified, justified. Holy sanctified and word. set apart. Sorry, Gertrude? Holy sanctified and set apart. Yeah. Holy, sanctified, set apart. So the whole list, we do the declaration in the morning, right? It is all of that oh, in, in us. But the point is, we should believe in it. We can say a lot of things, but we must believe in it. Right? I can say the world is round, but the scientists can come and say it's flat. But what do you believe? When you believe in something, when there's a conviction, Nothing can stop you, right? Nothing can stop you if you're convicted about something, right? So we are all of this blameless. We are adopted. We are his children. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. We are blessed, victorious, prosperous. We are ministers of God. We are God's children, okay? So now here's the thing. When we know all of this, how do we put it into practice? Right? It's not easy. Right? It's not like everything is going to be smooth. No, the devil is going to come. He's going to stop us. He's going to hinder us. He's going to bring challenges. But that's where the fight is. That's where God is. That's where you and I can say, I'm going to stand on God's word. Amen? Remember what happened when uh, the Lord Jesus, in the book of Matthew, he goes, he's fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Right? The devil comes and tempts him. Turn this stone into bread and you can eat. What does Jesus say? 
hey devil you're coming to me you're coming to me you're telling me about this you know who i am i am even before you i was there in this world i am the one who did he give an explanation what did he say what did he say what did jesus respond to the first temptation all the three that was recorded he said the uh, man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of god yes but before that he said it is written right so jesus didn't stand on his own strength or his own ability he said hey devil it's written and the devil came second time he said if you throw yourself the bible your word only says he'll send his angel psalms 91 to protect you right but then again jesus said but the bible also says it is written do not test the lord your god all three times jesus said it is written so what is the best example that we have when we are tempted when we are going through difficulties go back to this Maybe we have a sickness in our body. Maybe we are mentally disturbed. We are tired. We are weary. We go back to the word. Yeah, it's true. I'm tired. It's true that I have a sickness, but it is written by the stripes of Jesus I'm healed. We stand on that and believe that we will receive healing. Okay? So let's go to uh, page 12 and we'll start with chapter 4. A finished work right now the a finished work when you look at a construction a house or any construction that you're doing when a work is begun it does not look it doesn't it does, you see the architect will give you a rough sketch of what the house will look like right or what the building will look like but when the work is finished is where there is satisfaction yes or no right now what god did was all through the old testament god is giving us a rough sketch a blueprint of what's going to happen right how many prophecies hundreds of prophecies about jesus my seed will crush the serpent's head he will come out from israel he will be beaten. He will be a lamb taken to the slaughter. He will be born in Bethlehem. Hundreds of scriptures. It's all a blueprint of what is going to happen. Now, when Jesus came, he died on the cross. What did he say? That blueprint is finished. Right? This, what's interesting is the Greek word for finished. The Greek word is tetelestai. It's not in your notes, but I love that word, tetelestai. The Greek word means complete. It's over. It's, it's used in war, right? When, when two nations are going against each other in war, they say tetelestai. The war is complete. No more battle. There's one victorious. So let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. To 14. Yes, one of us can please read that. It's a long passage, but it's important that we understand this. Ephesians 1 3 to 14. It's on your notes. Go ahead. Blessed be the God and, fa and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all this spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having presented, predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the love. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in, him, in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. 
in him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the prize of his glory. In him we also trusted after we heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in him, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased position to the price of his glory? Amen. Right. Thank you, Lanusha. Right. So, Ephesians chapter 1 is a power packed chapter. It's filled with revelations. Right. It's filled with the power of God. Just by declaring all of this, you know, we can have such a victorious walk. Now, let's look at it. Let's break it down. What, what can we get from the, the list? Verse 3. Who has blessed us, the Father of our Lord Jesus, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ? Right? Who has blessed us? God the Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing through Christ Jesus. Right? So you and I are blessed with every spiritual blessing. You may ask, where is the blessing? It's there in you. All of it. We are saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. All of that is in us. These are spiritual blessings. Now, in the natural, we may not feel blessed. We say, God, nothing is working out right. When I try something, I'm failing. If I do this, I fail. If I, if I try to study, something is wrong. Everything is not going, nothing is going my way. And people may call you failure. People may look at us as failures or say, you know, you cannot achieve anything. What does it say here? Jesus says, I have blessed you with every spiritual blessing. Now, the point is, as believers, who you are going to listen to? Are you going to listen to people who accuse you? Say you can't do anything, you can't be anything. You have no gifts, you have no talents, you're not good in studies. You're not good in your business. You're not good in your work. You can't do anything. You can't have a family. Right? There'll be many people. Now, who are we listening to? Are we going to listen to that? Or you're going to say, hey, I reject that because the Bible says I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. And it's there for us. Now, the choice is up to us. This is what God has. It's like a, you know, a tank. And the tank is full of water. And you say, oh man, I'm thirsty. I want to uh, drink some water. But you're seeing the tank there. The tap also is there. Man, I'm thirsty. I want to drink water. And I say, go drink water then. It's there. But we are not using it. The resource is there. Right? So it is up to us to walk in this. Two, verse four. Just as... He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. The Father chose you and me before the foundation of the world. He chose us. Right? He predestined us before the foundation of the world. So what does that mean? When we... See, all of us have a life before, right? Before Jesus, before becoming believers, we may have lived a very worldly life, right? Living in sin, enjoying the things of the world, living a carnal life, right? But what does it say here? Having predestined, he chose us. The moment you and I become believers, all of this will flow into us. Now, it's like water. Or you think about uh, a river. How many of you have gone to the beach? You've gone to the beach, right? Now, can you tell the water stop, don't come here? I am here, don't come. The water doesn't care who you are. You can be the president of the nation also. The water, it's by nature, is to flow. That's the nature of water. Now, when you and I become believers, the nature of the Holy Spirit is to flow. He's like a river. Yes? Right? So he will flow. Now what happens when we don't keep flowing in that? It becomes dry. Right? 
He chose us before the foundation of the world. 3, verse 5. He pre predestined us to be adopted. What a wonderful verse, right? Imagine you and I are adopted. Being in a family, right? Think about this. If, you know, most of us may have parents, but some of us who don't have parents, right? Sometimes we feel lonely. We feel alone. We feel there's nobody to care for us, right? I have a lot of friends who have lost their parents at a very young age. That's not a nice feeling. That's definitely not a nice feeling. When they go home, there's probably some caretaker looking after them. There's no love. There's no care. There's no affection. They want a family. They want a father and mother. They want to go. You know, sometimes it's not, you know, by talking to people, we understand that the smallest of things can bring happiness to people. I've spoken to some of them. They say, I wish I had parents that we can go and sit in the park. That's their wish. Right? Being an orphan is not something that is exciting. But being adopted, having parents, having a family to care for you, that is so, it's a wonderful feeling. Jesus says, when the devil was there, and the devil, when he's, you know, when you were not in me, when you were living in sin, you were as if you were there in the world. But now as believers, you are my son, you are my daughter. I've adopted you. You're in my family. You're in my kingdom. Right? So if you read on, you know, in the book of uh, Paul writes in his epistles, he says that we are no longer slaves. We are no longer in bondage. We are set free by the blood of Jesus. So powerful. Right? Then we have redemption. Verse 7. In, in him we have redemption. How? Through his blood. What is the meaning of redemption? Anyone want to sh share? What is redemption? You know, we hear about these words. Redemption, justification, sanctification, glorification. What, what is redemption? Anyone would like to share? Anyone online? What, what, your understanding of redemption? Is purchasing, Pastor. Purchasing? A ransom, Charles says, a ransom. Okay, good. What else? Thank you. Uh, Daniel says, separated. Okay. Anything else? Okay. All of it is right, but let me give you a right understanding of redemption. Right? Now, this is just an example, but we'll have to translate it to understand it. Right? Now, imagine you go to a supermarket. You buy groceries and all of it, and since you bought groceries for a certain amount, they'll give you one coupon. That coupon says, the next time you come and shop in this place, you can use this coupon, you'll get 500 rupees off. Or 500, whatever your currencies are. Right? 500 dollars or 500 rupees off. So you say, okay. Now you got that coupon. What is that coupon worth? 500 rupees. It's just a piece of paper. It's not a real note. right? It's not real money, but it's worth that much. So after two months, again, you go. You go to the supermarket, you say, you buy everything, and then you say, hey, I've got a coupon. My bill is 600 rupees. I'm going to use the coupon. I take out the coupon, I give it. They say then the counter person says, OK, you have redeemed your coupon. That means? You have used this coupon. Now you will get the discount. So pay the remaining balance and go. Now that's called redeeming, right? Through a price that was paid. Now, when Jesus redeemed us, we were living in sin. He redeemed us how? By his own blood. So I'm going to paint a picture for you now. Imagine this the Father's on the throne. Okay? Jesus is standing next to you, next to the Father. And then Paul goes and stands there. Okay, Paul, you did this wrong, you did this wrong, you did this wrong. There are many things they've done wrong. The Father 
by nature is holy, he needs to punish sin. Yes? And he can't say, okay, sin, it's okay, Paul, you have a nice name, come. No. It's a sin. I have to deal with this. That moment, Jesus is standing there with his own blood. And he's saying, Father, look at this blood. This is my blood that I shed on the cross. My blood. I shed this on the cross. So you look at this blood. So the Father is saying, because of this blood of my son, you can come into heaven. So what's happened now? Jesus has paid the price for sin. Am I a sinner? Yes. But when Jesus, when the Father looks at us, what does he look at us as? Holy. Are we holy? We are becoming holy. Not yet. That's where he's redeemed us through the price of the blood. In the Old Testament, they'll cut the goat, they'll cut the, uh, the living sacrifice, they'll take the blood, they'll go to the high priest. Take. You'll learn that in the Old Testament. So the high priest will take it, he'll sprinkle the blood on the altar. Okay. Your sins are covered, not forgiven. Your sins are covered. I'm not looking at your sins. That's what the Father says. But now, through Jesus, our sins are forgiven. That's called redemption. From a place of darkness to a place of light. To a place of hell to a place of eternal joy with the Lord Jesus. Next. Everyone understood that example? Right? Always remember that. Picture these things. Right? I always say, tell students, you know, the greatest nation is our imagination. We need to, when you're reading the scriptures, you've got to imagine. You've got to think about it. Don't be reading the scripture and think about what is, uh, you know, what is there for lunch and what's there for dinner. It's not going to help you. You've got to think. You've got to imagine. God has given you imagination. So think and as you read. All right, next one. We have obtained an inheritance in verse 11. Now, not only did Jesus pay the price, bring us into his kingdom, but he's saying, I'm giving you an inheritance. Well, what is inheritance? You know, when you look at inheritance, it goes on from generation to generation to generation to generation. Right? Let me give you an example. Abraham, after Abraham, Isaac, after Isaac, who? Oh. Abraham, Isaac, Yaqub, then Joseph. Is that that inheritance? It's just going on and on and on. God told Abraham, I will bless you. Isaac was doubly blessed, more than Abraham. Jacob was even more. Right? Jacob and Esau, both were blessed. Because of the covenant, because there is an inheritance. Now, what is the inheritance that you and I have in Christ Jesus? It's not just material blessings. What is it? You and I have an eternal inheritance. When, when you and I die as believers, we will be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. What greater inheritance is there than that? We will be with Jesus. No more sin, no more death, no more sickness, no more headache, back pain, leg pain, nothing. We will be with the Lord Jesus. That's the greatest inheritance. And, um, the scriptures say, Jesus said right to his disciples, I'm going to create mansions for you in heaven. He's giving us an inheritance. We are with the saints, with all of the... Oh, you know, the, the saints of the Old Testament, the saints of the New Testament, we all have the same inheritance to be in heaven in, with, the, with the presence of the Lord Jesus. And finally, verse 13 says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Right? You and I are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Right? Now, for example, the devil will come. The devil will come and say, you know, we, we as believers, what is the Satan's job? 
Satan means what? Satan means accuser. Uh, you're like this. You did this wrong. You did that wrong. You will never do this. You will never do that. You will never be successful. I will, I will do this to your family. Uh, accusing. That's his job, right? But here it says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The moment we are sealed, when the devil comes and tells you, oh, you belong to me, I will take care of you. What, what can we say? Hey, I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there inside me. So that means I belong to Jesus. I cannot belong to you. I may do certain things wrong, but when I go ask God for forgiveness, he forgives me. But I don't belong to the devil. The choice is ours. Everything that we are learning in this, our identity, the choice is ours. Either we can apply it in our life, or we can apply it in the answer paper. One of those two. Answer paper will, you'll, there's no use. But when we apply it in our life, the devil is, he knows. So what happens, you know? God is not planning to do all this after, you know, 10 years from now. He's not doing it. He's saying the moment, the moment you and I become as believers, it doesn't matter the last 10 years, how many sins we did, what we have done, doesn't matter. Jesus is not looking at that. Saying the moment we become a believer, the finished work of the cross flows into our life. Then we learn, we grow, we walk in this. That's where the anointing comes. Amen? Right? So he has already completed the work. The work is finished. All we have to do is believe. Right? So let me give you this another example. You know, India won that cricket World Cup thing, no? I don't know which year it is, but think of a winning team. Now, when India won the World Cup, for those who are online, this is I'm talking about cricket. Uh, I think some of you in your nations uh, may not have cricket, but it's okay. So just giving this example, right? India won the World Cup. Now, what did we say after that? We won. How you won? You were sitting in your house. You didn't go for training. You didn't go on the field. You didn't win goal. You don't even know the 11 players' names. But you say, we won. Why? How can you say, we won? They, you didn't do anything. You were eating popcorn and watching. But they are struggling on the field. Why? Because you're part. You're in. You're an Indian. You're in that nation. You're already part of the victory. When we lose, what do we say? We lose. We lost. We win. We win. So now you and I, as believers, the Lord Jesus says it is finished. I've won the. I've defeated the enemy. So who's on the winning side? Some believers. We are on the winning side. Very simple. Now, will the winning side uh, be? You know, I remember what they did. They hired a bus. They went all around the city to show off. Right? Oh, we won the... Will the winning side say, Oh, okay, we're tired. Let's go home and sleep. No, all the tiredness is gone. Because in victory, on the cross, when Jesus said it is finished, he has defeated the devil. He's defeated. Right now, the devil is defeated. Whatever he's doing is just God allowing. But God is saying, I've given you all the authority. You and I, we have it. We have to use it. Okay? God's word has already accomplished it. And in all this, we speak our identity. Speak your faith. Declare what you want to see in your life. Declare it. Right? If you want to see yourself preaching the word, if you want to see yourself uh, you know, ministering, starting your own ministry, think about it, dream about it, have that vision and declare it. Every day you'll make the declaration, no? Yes? 15 years ago, I was a little boy, maybe in my early 20s. 
said, one day I'm going to preach. Right? So I will stand in front of the mirror. Okay, I will act like this thousand people sitting. I said, okay, everyone, rise up. Hold your Bibles. Let's declare. This is God's word. This is God. The whole thing. Then I'll say, okay, everyone, please be seated. And I will preach for 45 minutes in front of the mirror. One sermon every day. One sermon in the morning, one sermon in the evening. Before going to office, one sermon. Coming back from office, I'll prepare one more sermon, preach that. Who's the audience? Me. I'm looking in the mirror and preaching. So why? One day. One day I will preach. Then one day, was, uh, you know, I, would, I had a ruler. I'll take that ruler and keep playing the guitar on the ruler. One day, I will lead the worship. Think about it in the future. One day, it'll happen. So I have to start practicing now. I, I keep declaring, okay, Lord, Lord, one day I will. So what did I do? I didn't sit back and do nothing. I had to learn the instrument. I, there was effort. I had to learn the instrument, learn how to sing, learn how to lead worship. And over time, God gave the opportunity. What you speak is what you get. Oh, I don't think I can do this. That's what you'll get. Oh, I don't think I can uh, study so much. Uh, you know, too many subjects. I'm getting confused. That's what you'll get. <laughs> right? What you speak is what you get. You speak what God wants you to be. You speak what you want to be. You will receive it. That's what words are meant for. Words are powerful. Even at times, you know, I feel very tired and weary, very tired. It's my schedule keeps, every day I sleep about four hours, maximum four hours, not more than that. So even now, if I just close my eyes, I'll sleep. I tell myself, no, no sleepy, I'm strong. I have the strength of God. I have the wisdom of God. God will strengthen me. What I, I keep saying, oh, I'm sleepy, I'm sleepy, I'm sleepy. What will happen? While talking only, you'll sleep. All what we speak, right? Right. So there are times that even in this journey of walking this finished work, there will times we will fail, we will fall down. But the best part is we can stand up again. We can stand up again, right? So let's go to the next portion. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, let me read that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Our identity right now is in the spiritual realm. Right? What does Paul say? We are not fighting against flesh and blood. But we are fighting against principalities, against powers of darkness. Now picture this. Jesus is dying on the cross. They're all laughing at him. They are mocking him. Hey, you're really the Messiah. No, you come down from the cross. They're poking fun at him. When they tore off his clothes, they're, they, you know, they're, uh, uh, they're dividing his clothes among each other. They're mocking him. Now, in the natural, it is an utter failure. Think about it. Is it a failure in the natural? Jesus dying on the cross. Who wins? High priest, the Pharisees, they said, we win. We finished this fellow off. But on the cross, Jesus is saying, it is finished. I finished you. Even though physically, when people were looking, they saw... Imagine, in, in Jesus' earthly ministry, thousands of people were following him. At one point, there was 5,000. Another point, there was 8,000. Now, in Acts chapter 1, how many people are there? 120. Where are all the thousands gone? Oh, that means this person is not the Messiah. He died on the cross. The worst death. So, in that physical... In a natural eye, it looked like a failure. But what happened in the spiritual is that it was like Jesus holding Satan by the throat, putting him to the ground and crushing his head. 
right? Jesus, even the devil knows the power of the cross. The devil knows because he knows he is defeated. So people may look at us and say, oh, you're Christian, you don't know anything. You're, you're believing a false God. Where is Jesus? Where is he now? All those questions may come up. People may ridicule and mock at us. But where are you and I sitting? Right now we are in Bangalore. But what is the in our spiritual life, where are we sitting? With Jesus in heavenly places. So we can talk to him. We can speak to him. Right? See, persecutions, challenges are all part of it. Even the Lord Jesus went through it. So we must also go through it. Right? It's, not, it's nothing new. The book of Revelation says there will be persecution so, so much, so big. This is nothing. But through it all, we are seated with him in heavenly places. Right? The spiritual realm dominates the natural realm. Yes or no? What does the word dominate? The spiritual realm is in control of the natural realm. What's the best example? Jesus in his earthly ministry, what did he do? He prayed. He told his disciples, okay, you go. They took the boat and went. What did Jesus do? He walked on water. Is it natural? Is there anyone in this world who has walked on water? Apart from camera tricks? Anyone in this world? Naturally, is it possible to walk on water? The spiritual was dominated the natural. There was a big storm. Jesus is sleeping in the boat. He is tired. And Jesus says, gets up and hey, we're going to die. Jesus says, be still. Peace. Be still. The storm calms down. Now, does the storm has ears to listen? The storm doesn't care. But when Jesus spoke, it happened. The spiritual dominates the natural. Jesus took five loaves of bread and two fish. Right? In the natural, I can eat you and I can eat that alone in five minutes or ten minutes. Five loaves and two fish is nothing. Jesus said, Go give everyone. Imagine the disciples, what to do with this? <laughs> what ideas he's getting? <laughs> right. Naturally, not possible. But did it happen? Happen. So always remember the spiritual dominates the natural. In the natural, you may be going through, you know, sickness or challenges or uh, some mountains that are impossible to, to even climb. The spiritual, when you pray to God, God is not a God of the natural. He's a, he's a God of the spiritual. He can open doors. He can close doors. He can do anything. Yes or no? He can. Right? Learn to live out of the spiritual into the natural. Let me give you this example, right? It's happened many years ago. I went to... I used to go to a lot of cities and different states and and you know reach out, uh, preach and teach and all of that. So we went to one place. When I went there, uh, I was just a believer, right? I, I only knew about Daniel in the lion's den and Jesus walked on water and uh, these stories. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. So we had gone to this, it's a small town in, in a city in India. And after, it was a three-day meeting. So on the first day, after I preached my heart out, this is what Jesus can do. This is what uh, God is calling us for. After the meeting, one blind man came to me. Now this blind man, he didn't even have the white color in his eyes. No white. It's nothing. Just one line. Nothing is there. He came to me and he said, Pastor, you pray. God will give me eyesight. Now he had more faith than me. So God will give me eyes. I prayed, nothing happened. I went back home, I was very sad. I said, God, he has more faith than me. I prayed, I said, God, tomorrow if he comes, what to do? So he came the next day, front row he's sitting. 
after the whole day conference, I wanted to escape. But he came. I said, you pray for me. God will give me eyesight. And I prayed in faith. I said, God, do this for him. And I, when I saw his eyes, nothing is there. It's just a line. There's no eyeball also. There's nothing. Nothing happened. That night I said, God, do this. You know, I just prayed and I said, God, you do the supernatural. In the natural, there's no eyeball, there's no nothing. Right? But you're able to create things. Right? It's not about the person praying. It's not about, you know, uh, whether the person is anointed, not anointed. All of that is not, doesn't matter. But God, you can do this. Right? And if you've called me for ministry, I want to see the supernatural working. It shouldn't just be knowledge. I see your work. So the next day, uh, we went, we finished praying. He came. He said, you pray for me, God will bring you. Now, by the time I was very tired, right? I was very weak also. I said, okay, in Jesus' name, eyesight come back, eyeballs come back, and you will see in the name of Jesus. Two minutes prayer, and I wanted to go. Anyway, last day, no, I won't see him again. So I'll escape. But I prayed. And then he said, after the prayer, he said, yeah, I can see little. So what are you saying? Yeah, this, then I saw that white colors come for him. Pray again. Pray it again. And he, he opened his eyes like this. And after the prayer, he's looking at me straight into my eyes. Saying, praise the Lord, brother. Thank you so much. And he went and sat. And I thought to myself, God is a God who can create what is not there. He can make it there. Sometimes we limit God to you know, only blessings or God can only do this. No, he can do anything. It's about how we look at God. Right? Let's go to chapter 6. Everyone understanding? Right? Okay, let's do chapter 6. The mystery revealed. Now, Paul refers to this the mystery of his will. You know what the word mystery means? The word mystery means something that is hidden is revealed. Right? Mystery is something that's hidden. Nobody knows about it. No person, it's all hidden. Right? But Jesus is saying here, Paul is writing in Ephesians, the mystery of his will has been revealed to us. What's his will? Let's read verse 9 and 10. Anyone can read? Go ahead. Having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, with he proposed in himself that in the dispension of the fullness of the time he might greater together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. Yeah, thank you. So the mystery of his will is what? If you go down, it says that he was 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are on heaven and on earth. So he's saying, my will is that when you, when we become believers, he will gather us together as his. Not only these blessings that we studied about, anointing, blessings, redeemed, sanctification, he will gather us together. You know, you get the picture of a shepherd and a sheep, right? He gathering us together. Right, Ephesians 3, 1 to 7. Uh, sorry, in Ephesians 3 and verse 6, Paul declares that this mystery includes the Gentiles for the promise of the gospel. Now, why is this important? Why is this mystery important? And why is this, this verse important that, you know, it's even for the Gentiles? Now, let me give you a picture. The Jews believe that the Messiah comes only for them. 
right? Now, Jesus is saying, when Jesus spoke in many places in, in his ministry, he says, he goes and heals, uh, talks to a Samaritan woman, right? He heals people who are Gentiles, the Roman centurion servant he heals, right? Now, Jesus did not draw a distinction saying only Jews, only Gentiles. Gentiles didn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God the Father. That is why when the Apostle Paul, when he started his ministry, he says, God has called me to the Gentiles. But they opposed him. No, no, no. Don't go to the Gentiles. The Jesus has come for the Messiah. He's, he's the Messiah. He's come for the Jews. Why are you going and sharing this to the Gentiles? They are not part of this kingdom. You see, the thinking was gone wrong. But Jesus spoke to the Apostle Peter and he says, how can what, you know, through the dream, if you remember that, right? how can what I have called clean, how can you call it unclean? The mystery of God's will today is that every person in this world can accept Jesus and be part of his kingdom. He can be the biggest criminal in this world. The moment he accepts Jesus, he's in God's kingdom. Can you believe that? Paul himself, the apostle, says, I have killed many people. Was Paul a murderer? Apostle Paul, was he a murderer? Yes or no? He, says, he asked for letters. Let me go wipe out this religion of Christianity. He was a murderer. But when he became a believer, Everything changed. It's the same grace. It is the same gospel. It is the same mystery for all of us that has been revealed. Ephesians 3, 1 to 7 says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to you, how then, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was made known to the sons of man, and it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his apostles and prophets. The mystery of God has been revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. He brings revelation into our hearts. Right? Verse 6. That the Gentiles should follow, be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of Christ through the gospel. Of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effecting working of his power. What a privilege you and I have. Imagine when we share the gospel with somebody, when we are ministering to somebody right, and they become a believer, you are taking them and making them come into a kingdom of God, which is an eternal, everlasting kingdom. It says here, the mystery, they become heirs of the same body. They can be rich, poor, good-looking, bad-looking, Jews, Gentile, doesn't matter. You can be a criminal for 20 years, doesn't matter. Through the blood, we all receive the same forgiveness. Amen? All of us, through the blood. So when we look at people, never condemn them, never bring judgment upon them. Jesus didn't do it for us. We can always minister to them. No matter how far away they are from Christ, God can bring them back. His blood is willing to do it. Amen? Amen, amen. Let's just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what we have learned today, God. I pray, God, that you will enable each one of us to walk in these promises, to know our identity, to know who we are in you, God. We pray, Lord, that you will empower us by your Holy Spirit, oh God. We thank you. We bless your name, oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Uh, God bless you students online. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. Thank you very, very much, sir. Yes.